So if you're in the lending industry, my guest today comes as no surprise. If you've listened to anything from the housing wire to the daily mortgage news, you know exactly who I'm about to bring to the show today. James Kleeman, who is editor over the housing wire magazine. And this is phenomenal what we're going to have today, because one of the hot topics is broker agent compensation. And we are going to break that down as James was the lead reporter on this. He was in the courtroom during the Sitzer Burnett trial, and he brings a ton of knowledge to the show today. I'm super excited. I hope you guys enjoy this. Welcome back to the What's Your One More podcast. I'm your host, Quentin Harris, and today I am super stoked about our guest. You know, normally we don't get back-to-back guest episodes, but in this particular case, I was able to bring that to our audience here, and we are very excited. So if you're in the lending industry, as I said in the intro earlier, you know the housing wire, and you know the, the people that work there do so much reporting and so much editing on hot topics, and we are going to bring you one of those today. We have James Kleiman, who serves as managing editor for the housing wire with us today, and he was also a managing editor at the Real deal. And prior to that, he served as a supervising reporter at the New Jersey Advanced Media Company. James, welcome to the show today. We are super pumped to have you on here. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So you're joining us all the way from Brooklyn, New York today. I appreciate your time and and, and being a volunteer to host with me on the show. So a couple things we want to talk about. You know, there wasn't many reporters, you know, if you're a real estate agent, this is kind of like a buzzword right here, but there wasn't many reporters in the Sitzer Burnett trial. It's my understanding that you had full coverage of this and you were part of this and have done a tremendous job of kind of depicting what took place during that trial, not just the outcome, but how we got to that outcome. And you've had tremendous follow up on the copycat cases since then. So can we take just a brief moment and just not we only take the whole show because it's probably its own episode. But can we just break down what's going on in the real estate industry right now for real estate agents? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot to unpack. I I think the big one is just just to sort of set the scene here. It all started in 2018. Now, the National Association of Realtors, NAR, has been scrutinized by the Department of Justice and predecessors in the U.S. government for decades. This is a very powerful organization that has a lot of influence. It has historically been one of the top, if not the top, lobbyists in Washington for many years. They throw their weight around. They have more than 1.5 million members, and they're, they're one of the bigger advocates for homeownership if not the biggest. And so they carry a pretty big stick on their own. Um, and they've become sort of a, a de facto regulator of sorts in the real estate industry. Mm-hmm. And about nine out of 10 people, when they buy and sell a home, they're going to use a real estate agent. And the vast majority of the time, that agent is going to be a member of the National Association of Realtors, NAR. And the NAR, in in believing that they have a responsibility for providing smart, useful policy that benefits both the consumer and, frankly, the real estate agent, Mm -hmm. the realtor, um, have created a series of rules that, one, I think, absolutely do bring a lot of transparency to the marketplace, um, but they're fairly controversial because what they're effectively doing is saying, if you are using, on the sell side, a real estate agent to list your home, to market that home. If they do market that home within basically a day, they need to put that listing on the local MLS and the local MLS effectively says, yeah. And beyond that, you are also going to have to compensate the real estate agent on the other side of the transaction. And so we've seen a lot of lawyers in this space, there are a lot of lawyers who are very opportunistic and and see um, a lot of money in the mm-hmm. real estate. We are, we're talking trillions of dollars every year. And they say, look, these laws smell like an antitrust violation. And so they managed to get a class together in Missouri. This is the first um, state in which we've seen a verdict in a commission case. And they basically said, look, this is a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act, a a homeowner who sells their home should not have to pay a buyer's representative. And the NAR and the big brokerages have effectively conspired to either stabilize real estate commissions or inflate them. And we're going to prove it. And a jury in Missouri agreed with them. And the verdict came down at about with treble damages. So three times the uh, the initial verdict, it's going to be about $5.3 billion dollars 
uh, in, in potential damages. So that is getting, I wouldn't say negotiated right now. It's probably <laughs> going to get brought down if sure. the case even ends up, um, you know, not getting overturned at all. But it's a huge, huge loss for the NAR. It's a massive loss for the brokerages that didn't settle. Some brokerages did. And it could absolutely reshape how people buy and sell real estate and the agents that are part of the process. And since then, there's been, I believe, 22 copycat cases, and some have consolidated, but you know, the, all throughout the country, there's copycat cases. We got one in our backyard here in Florida as well, and they're all over the state. And I think a couple of them have, about eight of them have consolidated into a massive uh, class action, if you may. That sounds about right. You know, every single day there's a new one practically. You know, we, we were, we're sort of anticipating that there are going to be more than 60 to 70 um, this year alone. Uh, mm -hmm. But so much of that is going to depend on what happens in Sitzer Burnett and a couple of the other landmark cases. So but let's yeah, talk. Many... Yeah, talk a little bit about Sitzer Burnett. You know, the, you know, I, I got to say that I'm in the real estate business. You know, I've been doing this for 22 years. To me, this is not new. Like, you know, you have dual compensation and, and, and dual compensation, just so for our audience, if, if you're not familiar with that, that is where you as the seller are agreeing to compensate the buyer's agent for coming in and bringing buyers into your open house or to your listing to attract them to buy, to attract the buyer's agent to bring them over there. So this is this is kind of the debate at hand. That's that's the whole purpose of it is the, uh, the that they were in coercion, if you may. That's kind of how they had to really prove this, that the agents were in coercion of manipulating the price to have the seller pay for this, to be a part of the MLS to advertise. So in that, in that case, I'm, I'm shocked at the ruling. Like I'm absolutely baffled in it. And I'm surrounded by people because I'm in the industry that are baffled because we're just scratching our heads going, this has been the industry normal for quite some time. Like this is not a new thing. So what prompted this antitrust? I mean, cause here's what, here's the ironic part. Those sellers in Sitcher Burnett that won this class action lawsuit they ironically received the benefit of when they bought those homes from a previous seller that they were the beneficiary yeah, I don't of. think that's irony. I, I think that's just how the marketplace functions, right? And, and right. that's attributable to the rules that are in place that they're, they're um, saying violate antitrust provisions. So it, one, to start off, the plaintiffs in the case in Sitzer Burnett in Missouri, they're not saying that the agents themselves have conspired. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important distinction here. They're saying that the brokerages, the managing broker, the people who run Carol Williams franchises or, you know, uh, similar brokerages have effectively used this NAR rule as a vehicle to fix commissions and that they have self-policed agents and told them we are, you know, if not insinuating that uh, you're you're doing a bad thing by ever lowering your split. That um, you have to maintain this for the brokerage, okay. and so it's it's a slight distinction, but I think it's an important one. The individual agents who make up the bulk of the commissions in the U.S. who make the vast majority of the money that we're talking about here, they're not being sued. It's the brokerages themselves, and these are very small margin businesses. Um, many of which made no money during the drought years of 2022 and 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the ones that are on the hook here for potentially hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of damages. But it's the agents who make all the money, right? You know, typically they'll have like an 80% split or something, right? So, yeah, I, I think that's the first part of it. To the second part of the question, when the ruling came down that the jury effectively thought that there was a conspiracy. I was surprised because I was in the courtroom in Kansas City. I heard the vast majority of the arguments. Uh, I am someone who has studied this industry for about a decade, and I feel like I have a pretty good handle on the incentives, the individual mm -hmm. incentives from each party within the real estate ecosystem. So the managing broker, the you know the NAR, right, the trade mm -hmm. organization all the way down to the agent level, they're all individually incentivized to keep the commissions up. That doesn't mean they got together in a smoke-filled room and said, Correct. hey, buddy, we're, we're going we're gonna to decide that you always get 3% because when I'm on the other side of the deal, dude, I want my 3%, right? That's only fair, even if I'm a, a crap agent, right? right? There's nothing like that. However, there are cases in which 
people talk openly about commissions and there is that idea of self-policing. I, I think it's a pretty vague and un, imprecise, um, you know, sort of understanding of how this works. But basically what the plaintiffs are saying is you have all gotten together and you scratch your back, you scratch my back, I scratch your back, because I know that I'm going to be on the other side of the desk one day at a closing and I want to get my money and this system suits both of us, right? That may still be true without there being a conspiracy, right? So I, I think that's a really important thing to state for the record that mm -hmm. you can be incentivized to make decisions that economically benefit you without, you know, working, not being in cahoots with others. But yeah. a jury didn't feel the way I did. You know, they're, they're probably home sellers themselves who thought, you know what, my agent, when I sold my home, they did a decent job. Maybe they're entitled to their 2.5%, 2.75%, whatever it is. Why am I paying the opposition? Why am I paying the guy I'm negotiating against? And I think that that speaks to the everyman, even if it really doesn't account for the system in place that they, one, as you pointed out, already benefit from mm -hmm. when they sell the house. Right. And two, that there's an MLS and they have a buyer in the first place. Right. You know, like I just don't think like the average consumer thinks about it as a whole system. And and so to me, that's a problem with the industry not articulating how it works and how few people understand how real estate deals in the vast majority of cases actually happen. No, no, I appreciate that. I, I agree with you. Um, the thing I'm thinking here, so this is just for audience, this has been this coupled commission has been something since nineteen oh eight. Just let that sit in for a minute. We're 100 plus years into this. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. Now we got an antitrust. Like we waited 100 and really almost 120 years to, to come up with that. That that is that is something where um, I think the industry is left scratching its head going. This, this has been the way for so long. But back to the jury. I thought this was interesting. There wasn't many females on that that jury. I mean, uh, I think it was one. There was one, right? There was one. I think it was one. It was one. It's but, been a couple months. Yeah, but. I think it's one. But the vast majority of real estate agents are are primarily women, right? So you've got a male dominant jury, you know, who probably, you know, has their opinions, as you just stated. And uh, it's almost like the deck was rigged going into that, uh, going into that. And, uh, you know, I mean, speculating here, I can't prove anything, but speculating. And um, I think there was also, I've heard you mention that with the plaintiffs, they had one attorney. While the defendants each had their own attorneys, so this this attorney started to develop this relationship with the jury and really established his uh, charisma, if you may, out the gate with them. Whereas every time a defendant new attorney came up, they didn't have that opportunity. So it was almost like they had a third of the opportunity that that the plaintiff's attorney did, and he was he was pretty smooth, from what I understand. Yeah, and Michael Ketchmark, the plaintiff's attorney in Sister Burnett, is a very sharp, very charismatic guy. He's a local. You know, he's, he's sort of a son of Kansas City, mm -hmm. um, very well known in the area. He's he's donated quite a bit of money to both sides of the aisle. He is a fixture at the courthouse in Kansas City. I think there is some, you know, home field advantage, right? And, and sure. that's the nature of antitrust cases that are argued in district courts in the U.S. And so there were, there were certainly moments during the trial in which— <laughs> There were statements made that like, oh, you know, these are like these white shoe lawyers from Washington, D.C. What do they know about what it's like to be a, a home seller or a home buyer in the state of Missouri? You know, and, and maybe that does connect over time mm -hmm. with Missouri and certainly having the continuity of just being one person that they can follow um, does does hold quite a bit of advantage. I did feel like the NAR and and some of the uh, the attorneys missed opportunities to, as I said, articulate kind of the value proposition on the buy side and elaborate on the fact that the average real estate agent in Missouri, in Kansas City, Missouri, in almost anywhere in this country is a woman who mm -hmm. is independent and, uh, you know, is a neighbor of yours. She might be the, the leader of the Girl Scout Club, she, or, true, excuse me, uh, she might be somebody that you see at, you know, your local supermarket. She's 
the, the soccer mom who brings the oranges. She's at church. She's wherever. She's a member of the community. She's a fixture in that community. And that didn't really get portrayed very well. And so Agreed. the focus, which I, I think was very much intentional on, on Michael Ketchmark's part, was this is these corporate interests in this, you know, like Soron's Tower in Chicago, the NAR, and, uh, you know, a bunch of millionaire, billionaire brokerage owners who are so far removed from the everyday consumer, and they're portrayed as villains who are writing emails, explaining, you know, how to keep your commissions up to agents and to others. And I think that really had a big impact on the sentiment of the jury. I think the lawyers also just weren't likable. They weren't people you want to have a beer with. Now, yeah. I personally want my lawyer to be likable. I mean, that's maybe just just me. I mean, fortunately, I haven't been in a deposition in a while, but but that plays a role in it. A jury trial is always going to be a roll of the dice. And I don't think they rolled very well for the industry. Hmm. You know, that's uh, that's an interesting point. You know, many agents, almost all the agents that, you know, I've known throughout my career do give back to the community. They, they are fixtures, everything you just said. And they, that was not portrayed at all. It was exactly what you just said. And I think that that was a missed opportunity as well. And uh, it definitely showed up. So in your opinion, in these copycat cases, what's, what's to come of this two questions. What's to come of this? And do we start to see big teams? Because you mentioned earlier, the brokers aren't the ones that are really kind of, you know, they're, they're marginalized and, and making small margins in these kind of markets. Are there situations where teams have currently been named or they're going, or are these attorneys are starting to recognize the dynamics of the industry and they're starting to name teams? And, and is that a threat to the industry? They're, they're only, as far as I can recall, and, and again, there are so many cases now it's hard to remember every one of them, um, but there are maybe one or two cases in which a team leader or, you know, so, someone who's running a team of agents mm -hmm. at a broker somewhere in America is named, I think that is the case, in an Arizona suit and maybe one, one other in, in Texas. Okay. Um, ironically, um, one of the plaintiffs in that Texas case is somebody who owned a mortgage publication, <laughs> DS News, a couple of years back. But but that's, that's sort of an aside. For the most part... People aren't going after individual agents because you need to prove a conspiracy among the agents. Right. And I think it would be hard legally, and I'm not a lawyer. Um, I have no legal training. Um, but to prove a conspiracy between individual agents, even getting to discovery, I think would be challenging. I think it's a lot easier when you're trying to prove some sort of conspiracy. And that is the underpinning of, you know, all of these cases that the NAR rules or the local MLS rules... Some of them are different, like in Seattle, they're a little bit different. In New York, they're mm -hmm. a little bit different. But they're all largely the same, right? You compensate an agent right. uh, when you work with them. I do think that you're going to see a lot of managing brokers and franchises getting named. I mean, we've already seen a couple hundred at this point that have been named, and that's not going to stop. There are going to be more and more cases most of them are going to be consolidated or dismissed. And that's generally speaking because the legal system in America frowns upon copycat lawsuits. Okay. So a lot of them, what they do is they try to tweak one little difference. So we can make a material change in, and say, the scope of the conspiracy or the type of individual or company that is involved in the conspiracy or the circumstances of the injured party, um, then you have a better shot of it not getting rolled up into another one or dismissed outright. A lot of the people who are filing these cases are personal injury attorneys. These are not uh, really well-established uh, trial attorneys who've done antitrust and are really going to threaten NAR or some of the big, you know, better resource brokerages. But you still have to fight it. You still have to hire lawyers to handle it, to deal with it. Some of them might get through, right? I mean, right. It, it's... Or to know, I do think that there is a competitive advantage for some of the brokerages that have already settled some of these cases. So Remax and Anywhere and, and all of the respected, respective franchises and affiliates of those two brokerages, I think have a recruiting advantage. You don't have to worry about getting sued over this. We've already changed our policies. We've already paid the money to Michael Ketchmark. And, um, you know, the plaintiff said another case out of Illinois. 
And there's a big recruiting race going on in brokerage right now. When you right. see a lot of the Team Ridge model, right, that is definitely getting a lot bigger. I think the Team Ridge is kind of the future anyway. And I do think that some of these commission cases gives it a little bit more light. And um, how much of the playing field is going to change because specifically the commission cases, we're not really going to know until what's called injunctive relief comes in and sits or Burnett, which right. is essentially the judge, Judge Stephen Bow, in the case says, hey, we know cooperative compensation is a violation of um, antitrust law in the state of Missouri. I'm going to completely kill it. And every buyer now has to pay for their own agent or have some sort of an agreement with the buy side agent, you know, a broker agreement, as most people need to treat out it. Or um, I'm only going to require that there is, um, you know, a change to the existing NAR rule that says, you know, they're entitled to 0% or $0 or one cent or whatever. So that's going to really determine how big the advantage is. Yeah. And then and that judge during that injunctive relief process is going to sit down and say, hey, guys, listen, these companies only have X amount of dollar. Like, I know you won 5.3. Like, they, they don't have it to give to you. So this doesn't make sense for me to, you know, see this through because they don't have it. Yeah. And the other side of the coin is also if you're a trial attorney and you are trying to take down an industry, you don't try to, ex you know, Make them extinct. You don't. You don't right. try to kill it because you don't make any money on that, right? Right. So they want to extract uh, as much money as they can while also ensuring that the companies, the individuals, are able to continue doing business. Yeah. Maybe the NR doesn't quite qualify, um, but you know, certainly on the brokerage level, the intention here is not to put them out of business. The intention is to get as many pounds of flesh as they can possibly get, and and. I expect, you know, just given the settlements, I think it was like eighty-four million for anywhere and fifty something million for Remax. The plaintiffs even said, This is as much as we could have made. Like I mentioned earlier in the program, couldn't like these are not billion dollar revenue businesses. Right. Or maybe revenue they are, but like profit wise, mm -hmm. they're just they don't have that kind of money. You don't think they wanted a hundred million out of anywhere? You don't think <laughs> yeah. they wanted out of Remax? Like that's all they could get. Right. No, that makes complete sense. You know, so I had someone present to me once and said, "Hey, listen, the quickest way to solve the MLS situation is because the, the thought is it's restrictive, right? That's the whole point. Like, I'm not going to put your property or allow it to go into MLS if we don't have this this dual compensation, if you may." The thought to that was. Someone mentioned just to open up the MLS to the general public, open it wide to where everyone can get in there, everyone can see it, and it doesn't require that to be in there and, and fixes this whole thing. I thought that that was a pretty interesting concept, but I'd love to get your thoughts on it. I, I guess the issue is like, then what's the value of the individual MLSs? Well, the, like, yeah, why, correct. Why would an agent pay money to it? So they all dissolve, right? So maybe you need a national MLS. Is that Zillow? I, I don't know. That, yeah. That would certainly terrify a lot of agents, I think. <laughs> sure. Um, prospect of that, right? Like, I, I just don't know if you don't have an MLS, um, you know, association that is able to check that the information is accurate, that there is no shady business. And there's some shady business already in real estate, right? You encounter mm -hmm. it. I encounter it through my work as a journalist. Um, I think there would be a lot more shady business if you open it up and basically say, Hey, it's a free for all. Like <laughs> people can check out whatever they want. Now, there's a wide gulf between a free for all and having more transparency. I think the consumer should know when they look on Zillow what the comp is, right? I, I think everyone should know. Yeah, we should have some site. I don't know about Zillow. Zillow's typically not accurate, but there should be yeah. some sort of accuracy site such as that. Well, that the comes through the MLS, right? That should say, "Hey, listen, this is this is the information. This is what the." you know, the compensation is on it for sure. Because as a lender, I have to disclose everything, right? I, I, everything's disclosed well, down to the penny. Yeah. So it, I do agree that that would also, it, more importantly, just create some clarity. That's all it would do. I, I think you're, here's another one to throw at you, and this is sort of a wild, I, I know real estate agents, if you're listening, I'm sorry, but just throw it out there. There are a lot of professions in America in which very highly educated, highly skilled people are paid hourly. They are not paid based on the value of someone's property, right? And we're indexing the compensation for professionals to 
collateralized property, right? Like, right. And an agent is necessarily better at their job because they sold a three hundred thousand dollar house versus a six hundred thousand dollar house, but that is how they're compensated. And so, why not have a flat fee? Why not have an hourly fee? There are brokerages that offer flat fees. They haven't really succeeded. The cynic or plaintiff in one of these cases would argue it's because the realtor associations and others have effectively said, we're not going to do business with them, right? Mm -hmm. And steered their clients. I don't know if you can prove that, um, but certainly that's that's what they would argue. But why not have an hourly fee? If you only do 20 hours of work on this home, why should you make $70,000 on it, right? Like, why should you be paid more than the best trial attorneys in America, right? Well, I mean, the argument to that is was... if they sell it that quickly, right? Because they were that good and they only had to put 20 hours into it, they were that good, right? And there might be another agent that takes, you know, six months to get it sold when just figuratively speaking in this example, what if the other agent got it done in, you know, less than a week and put 20 hours into it? They're just that much better at their job. You know, so statistically speaking, people that are better at their job do get paid more, you know, so that that part I could see being an argument in that. And, and for the most part, I think there are some agents that, you know, that, let's get, you know, throw this out there. They didn't make the rules to this. They just happened to be playing the game. Right. So they're, they're it's not it's definitely and I know you're not saying this, but it's not their fault. And you're not saying that either. You're just saying it's just the way it is. It's the nature of the business since 1908. And they happen to be in the business and they're working within the realms of what they've you know, have been given rule wise to work at. I will say this. We, and everybody in our industry has said this for time. There is a cleanse that has needed to happen on both the lending side and on the agent side, because from 2020 to 2021, both of the real estate sides. I'm talking about lending and real estate agents. It became get rich quick. And I know people that got out of this business in 08, got right back in it for this wave, if you made. And they said, well, cause I can, I can make a lot of money doing this. Well, they knew it. They knew it. They did It wasn't a career path for them. It was a escalation, if you may, of income. And so they got in, got out. Those, those individuals may not be as same level of commitment and systems and talent and all those other things that justify that person that makes more that's been doing that, not because they've been in there longer, but because it's actually a career to them and they're treating it like a career. And I, I think those individuals are the ones that represent the uh, the people that I think are earning what they get paid. And I also think that there's ones that are getting paid way more than they should. And I have good news for you. If you think that there are a lot of real estate agents who are doing it right and are getting paid appropriately and earning their money, they're probably not going to be dramatically affected Correct. by the worst case scenario of these cases. So we know already that about, it's what the traditionally known as the 80-20 rule. Mm -hmm. I think in real estate, it's probably closer to 90-10. Agreed 100%. And, and so it's usually, you know, and, and so I'll look at my hometown of Wyckoff, New Jersey, and there are about four really, really, really good agents and they scoop up probably 65% of the business. Now, there's not much business because there are not a lot of homes <laughs> on the market in Wyckoff, New Jersey. You know, it's, it's part of the bigger inventory trend. Um, but they they scoop up so much of that business because mm -hmm. they've been doing it forever. They are not going to be deterred by, you know, having to get somebody to sign a buyer's Agreed. record agreement. Sure. You know, they're, they're going to figure it out. They're going to adapt. They're probably going to be better served by not having to work with crappy agents who don't know what they're doing because they represented a buyer's, you know, nephew on a transaction and nearly killed the deal due to their incompetence. Right. So they're probably going to get more business. I mean, what we've already seen trend-wise is that 90-10, it used to be the 80-20. It keeps creeping up and up and up. And so if you think that cooperative compensation goes away, the people who are most likely to not renew their NAR membership who are not going to stick with their local association, they're the people who do it part-time. They're the people who are not the professionals. It's not a career. It's a side hustle. It's a hobby. It's something they do occasionally to make a bit of cash. Yep. But they're not the real pros. The real pros should be happy about Sitzer Burnett because their their portion of the pie is only going to get bigger, in my opinion. Well, the only fear I've heard from the pros, and I think this is a fair argument, is there's this um, there's this wave of compression they're going to have to go through. And you're going to have a wave of people that uh, the desperation plea, if you may, those individuals you just described that, that may not be good at their job, they're going to be willing to do this for 
they're going to be willing to do this for a flat fee, and they're going to undercut the professional who can get that home sold. And it's going to take time to realize that, hey, this person wasn't good. They didn't get this home sold. So there's this there's this, this cycle that's going to have to go through in order – kind of like um, when assist to sell was really big. Uh, and I should – loose term, but assist to sell was big like in six and you know, 06 and 05. But they're gone now, right? It didn't work. To your point earlier in the conversation, it didn't work. But it took two years for that to kind of trans, you know, make its way through the system, if you may. And I feel like the pros kind of revert back to that, and they kind of they kind of associate this with assist to sell and having to let that cycle through again. I think that's the only thing that's probably fearful on their end is fighting through that minutia. And there there might be a little bit of uh, turbulence in the first year or two if there is a major change in in the NAR's policy, or maybe the NAR doesn't survive any of this at all. And there's even mm-hmm. bigger people that we, you know, I mean, we, we could come up with scenarios. Sure. And long. The reality is the American public has gotten very accustomed to expecting full service. And that's the reason that they don't go with discount brokerages very often, at least not on the sell side. Now on the buy side, there are a lot of complicating factors there. Mm-hmm. If you decouple the compensation from the agent, you know, I could certainly see some professionals maybe getting in on some of that business, lawyers probably would would benefit the most, right? Um, in some ways, maybe even a, an LO would be able to, to, obviously there are complicating factors there as well, right. but I mean, it's it's really the marginal agent who I think is most at risk. And, and even if they're willing to do it for, you know, half a percent or 1%, like if you can't deliver a good experience, if, if you make the biggest transaction of their lives hell, People are going to find out real quick, and um, and and it's not going to be sustainable. So I, I still believe that the average American consumer, not even the average, nine out of ten American consumers expect and demand real good service. And if they don't get it, you know, that business is not going to survive. Yeah, you know, kind of transition to the buyer. You kind of led right into that. So how does this look for the buyer? Because um, we're already seeing it in our market. We're already seeing the, the zero percent compensation in the MLS right now. How does this work for the buyer? To, a couple of trains of thoughts here. For the buyer that doesn't have that money in the transaction to pay the agent because they're already in a minimum down payment situation or they're in a down payment assistance uh, situation or, hey, they're a VA buyer. Like VA cannot pay that. That buyer is not allowed to pay that at all. So and the, and the HUD side hasn't changed. They're, they've admittedly said they're not going to change that. So how does that work if you're an agent and we're up against those situations and you're a buyer and those are some of your scenarios? I mean, you know, I've kind of played through this in my head and I'm not finding much of an answer other than, well, I mean, Maybe it's a flat five hundred dollar fee, or maybe the lender helps assist at some capacity. I mean, there was this time where everyone thought the lender would just figure it out, and I'm like, hey, it's already built into the guidelines. That's why we have seller concessions. That's originally used to help offset that. So, um, what what are you hearing? What are your thoughts? So, yeah, I think this is probably the area in which there is the most jeopardy. Okay. There's the most to lose. There's the most controversy. The I, I think it's hard to argue that the consumer is better served in Agreed. those. Price tranches um, with with you know the, the worst case scenario of cooperative compensation being decoupled and them having to come up with five six seven ten thousand dollars on their own they they literally do not have it and the lenders will not permit that to get rolled in uh, in a lot of cases that's a tough one I, I think yeah. either the law has to change or there's going to be some sort of functionary who sees an opportunity and says hey you can't afford a real estate agent. The seller is not going to do it. You know, hire me. I'll do just the basics. Um, but you're still going to be largely on your own, right? Because you have to pay for service. People need to be compensated to be doing, you know, work that's commensurate with the money that they're going to make. That's how this system still works. I think in the vast majority of cases, sellers will still see the value in compensating the buyer agent. They're probably less likely, but still more than 50% of the time, I'm, I'm making predictions, which is always dangerous here. <laughs> um, and they will still, even with like, you know, lower kind of FHA loan brackets, still make an offer of compensation to a buy side agent because they want a smooth, smart process at the price point that they still believe represents the value of their home and what they need to make on it. I still think that's still a good system for most people. There are absolutely going to be, you know, a double-digit percentage of buyers who just 
can't afford it. And the sellers will, are going to say, tough shit, buddy. Right. You know, and, and there's going to be a reckoning, you know, the HUD is not going to change. Even if HUD could change, it would need them 6 million years to even find out, you know, how to do it. And it, it's just like, they're not built for this sort of thing. The FHFA, I mean, we know that they're a little bit more interested these days in serving those communities, mixed track record, right? Could mm -hmm. they provide something? They're a lot quicker to action than HUD in general. Um, you know, a lot of those borrowers probably wouldn't qualify, um, but maybe, I don't know, could you see like a DPA maybe stepping in, helping, you know, being able to roll that into kind of the costs? Maybe, but yeah, it's most tough. People don't I mean, we've that, checked yeah. with our DPAs, and absolutely five hundred dollars is the max fee that they'll roll in, and that's not that's 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 administrative fees. That's all they'll do. That's all they're allowed to do because most of those DPAs are state funded. So that's going to end lies the challenge. And you know, ultimately, this is the old adage when you know when you cut price, it's always the consumer that loses. And this is a great example of that, you know, and uh, I hope there's a better fix than what we're staring down the pipeline of right now on that, because you said it earlier, if if I as a seller don't understand that I need to help compensate the other side, I'm losing pool of buyers that could be coming to my house to maybe even have multiple offers to raise the price point. It's not, I mean, maybe I'm offsetting in the right, in the rise of the price in multiple offers than what I'm paying on the other side. I mean, there's a lot of different ways of looking at that, but I say at this point, in my opinion, I'm not gonna say the burden falls on the listing agent. That's not what I'm saying, but I believe there is a fiduciary responsibility and there's a responsibility of that listing agent to sit down with that seller and explain the benefits, as you said, of the buy side and why this is important and what this means to our listing, what it means to our property. And then it's their choice at that point, right? But at least explain it and advocate for it. That's extremely important. Yeah, I mean, the, the major thing that we're seeing is, well, let's take a look at Washington. They have an MLS that is not a realtor-owned MLS They've seen no material change in, you know, really anything since they got rid of, you know, a lot of the NAR rules that were, were originally put in place for the vast majority of people. So I don't think that this would have a huge impact in most areas. Certainly anybody who's in sort of a middle or higher tier, they're going to pay agents. And by the way, like you look at commissions for luxury, nobody's getting 3% of luxury, right? Like we Not we have, often. Very rare, right? Yep, I mean, right. you got to be like a, a shake who's, <laughs> who has no idea how anything is, works and, and he's avid to pay, whatever. But yeah, I, I mean, there, there's no fixed commission. There's no rate. It is negotiable. I don't think that people know that. I talk to relatives of mine, friends of mine, and, you know, I'm the annoying guy who talks about housing all day long. <laughs> and like, what? Like, I thought you just, you know, uh, they didn't explain it or maybe they did, but it was buried in a bunch of other stuff. The industry has not done a good job of articulating one the value or two how it freaking works and so I, I think that's partly because we have so many we have so many practitioners we have more agents and homes on the market right now and Correct. that's that's a that's a fundamental dysfunction right in the marketplace right and that doesn't get better um the nar has done a really poor job in my opinion of explaining how it works and you know, nobody really knows what the commissions are. Yeah. The barrier of entry is real easy too, by the way. There's another issue. It's easy. <laughs> it's so much harder to be an LO. And there are still like, despite, you know, all of the, the hoops that you have to go through, there's still a lot of bad LOs, right? Oh, absolutely. So how many absolute crap agents there are, you know, that's a problem. That That is a huge image problem. Yeah. And, and I know a lot of agents that will agree with that because they take offense to the fact that they are lumped into that kind of, you know pool as you described there. So, um, but you know, I think as, as we come through this kind of couple of final thoughts on this, where do you see, um, kind of, kind of where do you see this shaking out from a borrower's perspective? Are they a, a new buyer, new homeowner? Are they now, are they now, cause it only takes a little bit of social media, right? Are, are they now starting to see and unravel some of the stuff that you're describing? And are they actually coming to the table and saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to pay or are they come to the table going, um, do I have to pay? Or are they come to the table going, I don't want to pay. Like, what are you seeing out there as on the streets as you're talking to people? So we, we do a lot of surveys specifically on questions just like this. And so yeah. I, I can give you probably as close as we're going to get to what's actually happening across different markets. I should say, however, this is filtered through the lens of the agents themselves. Okay. Love these surveys. They are not hearing much of anything on the buy side or the sell side about it. Occasionally they will get asked questions, increasingly from the direction of their managing broker or someone else 
at the organization there already stating, hey, this is what's happening with these lawsuits. I want to explain to you how I get paid and what your options are, and I want to explain how the commissions work and why we believe that it is in your best interest as the seller to be compensating the buy side agent because it's going to give you this big pool of buyers. And ultimately, as you said earlier, you're more likely in a low inventory environment to get a bidding war <laughs> than even getting your price if you try to get cheap on the compensation. Yeah. So they are articulating one how it works. They're they're doing a much better job than the NAR is doing, which yep. you know, make make that what you will. Yeah. Uh, the second part of it is we're seeing very little reportage on sellers saying, no, to hell with them. I'm not paying the buy side agent. And that borrower, that buyer is just going to have to figure it out. We are also not hearing from buy side agents that they're having those conversations with buyers, even at the lower price points where you're more likely to be getting FHA, VA, or, you know, more complicated uh, loans that are non QM. So we know that the conversations are starting to percolate. We're not seeing them tangibly impact deals. Mm -hmm. Are a couple here and there, like you know, real estate is such a big um, kind of messy industry. There are, I mean, they're happening somewhere. There are occasionally instances in which this is occurring. Not very many, from what we can tell. Yeah, I mean, you know, these are not scientific scientific studies. These are you know, two hundred, three hundred people. It's not a big sample, but we haven't heard of it. I think we would. We're pretty close to the people on the ground here. I do think that we're going to see more of it if there is uh, a splashy injunctive relief verdict. Uh, verdict's probably not the right word, but, um, you know, decision on Sister Burnett, and there's some healing with some of the other cases. But aside from that, I, I just don't see a whole lot there. The big question is really, as you said, just the VA, the FHA, what happens there? Yeah, and I mean, we're in offices all day long, and literally, it's probably one out of every hundred. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's one yeah. out of every two fifty. It's just not. You're not Makes really sense. seeing it come to the surface level. It's not a point of contention. It's not a roadblock in the conversation. And if anything, you like you nailed it. People are hitting it head on. They're addressing it, and the minute they address it, and I think it adds to your point about clarity in the industry. The minute we have that clarity, there's no more questions, and it's like, okay, we're done. We're good. Let's move on. Next thing. Yeah, because like the average buyer or seller is like, oh yeah, it makes sense that they would get paid for their work. Like right. it's not a crazy yeah, I'm not you asking know, you to work for free here. Mental gymnastic. Yeah, exactly. So I, I don't think it's a gonna be a huge deal. I do think it's going to be a bigger deal if there's a lack of um clear delineation as to what you can and cannot do uh for a VA and and you know some of those borrowers. But what we're not gonna get any any clear understanding until probably April May. Yeah. At the early <laughs> You guys just finished up Housing Week. Uh, you had a debate, ir ironically, I believe it was last yeah. Friday. They had a. I don't know if I call it a debate, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, and uh, if our viewers wanted to tune into that, where could they go see um, the lead attorney? Is it Ketchberg from the Sister Burnett? Ketchmark, excuse me, Ketchmark has got a chance to debate a, uh, a prominent, outspoken real estate agent in, uh, in Florida here and is very passionate about the real estate industry. And uh, like you said, I'm not sure it was much of a debate, but uh, if you like entertainment value, this might be for you. So where could they go see that, um, that webinar and that, that debate that took place? Michael Ketchmark, he was the plaintiff in the Sitzer Burnett case, and he has another big case that is national, not just in Missouri. And he squared off against Anthony Lamacchia, who is a broker owner out of Massachusetts. And we have a page set up. It's housingwire.com slash commission hyphen lawsuits backslash. And we have a whole page. We have a history of all the lawsuits dating back to 2019. We have, um, you know, a number of videos where we explain the different elements of it. We have God, probably a hundred something stories that we've written about it over the last year plus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hopefully it's it's a really useful resource for people. And if people have additional questions, I love just getting on the phone and chatting with people. So feel free to email me. It's james at hwmedia.com or hit me up on LinkedIn. Again, James Kleiman, K-L-E-I-M-A-N-N. -N. And uh, happy to fill you in or answer the questions to the best of my ability. Guys, we're going to have all that in our show notes at What's Your One More with the number one. Every bit of that detail will be in there. Feel free to click on it. Highly urge if you want up-to-date 
factual timelines, tune into that website. They do a great job of statistically just drawing out the map of how we got here and what's up to date and all the features on there. It's just, it's a wonderful website. And uh, if you're not a member of the Housing Wire, I highly suggest you join that as well because it's a great publication with great data, great just information all around. James, I can't thank you enough for being on the show today, uh, spending your time with us here. You're just a plethora of information and uh, really kind of dropping a lot of knowledge bombs on everybody for us here today. So thank you for being on the show. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Hope to do it again. Absolutely, guys. If you like what you're hearing, please five-star review this podcast. On any platform you listen to your podcast, we would especially love it if you did it at Apple and left us a review. It would mean a ton to us. And uh, enjoying all the feedback you're giving us at What's Your One More on our YouTube channel. Until the next episode, we'll see you guys at What's Your One More. I got one more shot. I'm going to make it. One more chance. I'm going to take it. I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it. I got one life to live, so I put all into it, yeah.